Hi all, my name is Ryan and welcome to my channel What The Pop where we discuss pop culture in general and Buffy a lot. So first up, a spoiler alert. If you haven't seen Buffy at least once, I may talk about things that relate to future plot points. So if you don't like spoilers, I suggest you subscribe and come back after you've watched it all. Uh, today we are looking at what exactly was it about Buffy that made it the greatest show ever. Now when magazines and websites put together their lists of the greatest shows of all time, it nearly always features Buffy. It was number 38 on Rolling Stone's list, number 30 on IGN's, and appeared on Time's 100 Greatest TV Shows. Conversely, it didn't appear on Newsweek's Top 100 at all, which is how you know that their list is absolute garbage. Now with seven seasons to its name, it would be fairly easy to pull out a top 10 or top 20 reasons why Buffy is the greatest show ever, by showing a multitude of examples of the brilliance of its writing, both plots and dialogue, its directing, and the acting ability of the cast. Buffy has some of the best episodes of television ever written and acted, and it is a disgusting stain on the Emmys that this brilliance was never awarded. But this isn't a top 10 or 20 moments list, this is about one thing. Buffy changed television, and changed the way the consumers interact around television. It often gets thrown around that Buffy was groundbreaking, or pioneering, but what does that actually mean? What did Buffy do that was so different to everything before it? What exactly made it groundbreaking? It wasn't just its strong female hero protagonist. Xena was already in its third season uh, when Buffy came out, and Joss apparently said that Xena made Buffy possible. It wasn't making a musical episode either. Xena beat Buffy there too. It wasn't even making a redemptive arc for former villains because, well, Xena's entire story was a redemptive villain arc. Okay, so Xena was groundbreaking too, but it never quite had the cultural impact that Buffy the Vampire Slayer did. Now, most, met net net most network TV was designed to be episodically consumable. That is, if you missed an episode, you weren't suddenly lost as to everything that was going on in an overarching story. Xena was a contemporary example of that at the time. Sure, some shows had events that ran across a few episodes, but it wasn't the norm to have a main storyline run the entire season, or as it became known because of Buffy, the big bad. If you compare that to contemporary shows in the recent past like Teen Wolf, or current shows like Riverdale, they all now have a season long arc. A story that runs over the top of everything else that is happening, that usually results in a big showdown or reveal at the end of the season. Nowadays, it seems such a mainstay of television, particularly in the, uh, in the streaming era, that we take it for granted. But if you look back to television prior to that period, the closest you got to a big bad were story arcs that may be two-parters or over a few episodes, but seldom was there a greater story to be served other than the monster of the week. Now, while we call it the Monster of the Week in relation to sci-fi, it was the same format in most other shows. The Crime of the Week in procedural crime dramas, like Law and Order. The Medical Issue of the Week in medical dramas, like ER and Chicago Hope. Or the Case of the Week in lawyer shows, like The Practice or Boston Legal. Most TV followed fairly standard formula. Give the good guys an issue to solve. Throw some problems in there so solving it isn't straightforward. Have them solve it in the end then have basically everything back to the way it was, ready for the next episode. It was a tried and tested formula that had been used in television for years. So how then did Buffy change all that? And why was it so significant? Buffy did two things that differentiated it from all the other series before it. The first is that it didn't treat its target audience, teenagers, like idiots. Shows tended to treat teenagers as kids or as adults. It seldom spoke to them in their own language, which, as anyone who has ever spent any time around teenagers knows, is slang. Buffy spoke to them in a voice that was entirely its own. While there was the occasional Valley Girl slang, it was more a way of talking rather than particular words or phrases. It was so unique that it generated its own term, Buffy speak, which is so embedded in pop culture that it is now the name of a TV trope. Of Buffy Speak, Kyle Calgren said, Whedon's voice is so distinct that Buffy Speak has become a mode of language unto its own, one codified by a jumbling of nouniness and jectivage into languagey bits that sound like your brain forgot words before spontaneously re-remembering them. 
Now, I was 19 when I saw my first episode of Buffy, and apart from everything else that makes Buffy great, the language is one of the things that stood out to me uh, the most. Why? Because Buffy and her friends spoke how I spoke. Wit and sarcasm, the use of nouns as verbs and vice versa, and non-formal sentence structures with meaning implied by context, all delivered at breakneck speed. The characters appealed to me not just in what they said, but in the way they said it. They spoke in my voice. Now the genius in this kind of speech is that it gives much of the slang a timeless quality. As I said earlier, the teenage lexicon is ephemeral. It changes from year to year so much so that just as adults are finally beginning to understand what teenagers are saying, they stop saying that and start using new slang. So shows that latch on to modern slang quickly become dated and often cringy uh, when viewed years later. But by couching the slang in a way of speech rather than specific words or phrases, Buffy's slang still appears to teenagers discovering it today, as it is relatively timeless. This single aspect helps it bridge any time gap, for while technology, music and fashion indelibly placed Buffy in the 90s, the way they speak could easily translate to a show film today. And it frequently does. Buffy speak is now a mainstay of the modern lexicon. Now while the way they said things was important uh, to the target audience, it paled in comparison to what was being said. And this is where Buffy truly elevated television. Buffy had depth. Starting from the overarching high school as hell metaphor, Buffy used its structure to explore the human condition. The monster of the week was never just a monster of the week. It was a way to explore various aspects of what it meant to grow up, of the challenges we face, of the internal and external struggles, and of greater notions of good and evil, right and wrong, morality, actions and consequences. Whether it was personal notions of wanting to belong, peer pressure and the pack mentality in Season 1 episode The Pack, notions of self-identity in Season 2 episode Halloween, uh, direct social commentary on victims being silenced in Season 4 episode Hush, or the notion of nature versus nurture seen in Faith's entire character arc, Buffy's writers explored and approached these ideas with a level of sophistication and intelligence that had never been seen in television before. Suddenly, television was no longer just entertainment, it was now literature and worthy of being discussed, dissected and analysed. And boy did we do just that. From the start, Buffy spawned discussion on fan sites and in chat rooms all across the internet. At a time when the general public was discovering one of the internet's primary purposes, the exchange of ideas with people everywhere, discussion about Buffy swelled. While many shows were generating discussion, it usually centred on characters, plots, relationships, or fanfic, with everyone's favourite subgenre flash slashfic. Now, while Buffy generated this kind of discussion, it also started to generating deeper discussions, discussions beyond the norm. Buffy was no longer just being watched and talked about, its deeper meanings, its messages, its ideas and concepts were being analysed and discussed in a way and to a level that TV seldom ever was. It was now being discussed in the way reserved for great literary works, like The Great Gatsby or the works of Shakespeare. Buffy had made television a true literary art form. And the amazing thing about Buffy is that as the indelible impact of Buffy on pop culture has become more and more apparent over time, the depths of those discussions and the level of that analysis has only increased. With multiple books, journals, websites, podcasts, conventions, courses and YouTube channels like this one, all around Buffyology uh, still being prevalent, Buffy has cemented itself as a literary and cultural mainstay. Shows today owe so much to the way Buffy structured its episodes and seasons that its influence can be seen across all genres. Julie Plek, for example, said that Legacies will be her love letter to Harry Potter and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Season-long arts and the big bad are all now standards of television. But the subtler explorations, the monster of the week as a tool to examine aspects of characters, as a way to develop and form fully realised characters, has also become a mainstay. It is the reason that shows like Grey's Anatomy are so successful. The monster of the week is replaced with the medical issue of the week, but it's used to the same effect, to explore larger, character-driven story arcs and issues, both personal and external, and who you are when all of that is said and done. 
Shonda Rhimes, the creator of Grey's Anatomy, said in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter that she binge-watched Buffy after becoming a mother and said, I was very inspired by Buffy, mainly because it felt very fresh and new and like something that hadn't been on television before. I felt like I rediscovered television again uh, by binge-watching the first, I think it was the first five or six seasons of it, in a row when I was a new mother. And that's pretty much sums up how the majority of us feel about it. That it was fresh and new and worth dissecting and talking about. The Great Gatsby was released 95 years ago and is still a much discussed and dissected literary work. Perhaps in another 70 years they will still be discussing the cultural impact of Buffy.